querido profesor Sánchez, muchas gracias por estar a, acá con nosotros esta mañana. Uh, you are a, a professor of uh, anthropology at the DIHID, and your work uh, has mostly been concerned with uh, crowd sociality, uh, spirit possession, crowds and publics. Uh, you also have links between the religious and the political, which uh, will be emphasized uh, uh, throughout this interview as well. And uh, basically our goal for the next 45 minutes or so is to kind of like uh, go over some of your writings, some of the things you've said, some of the contributions you've made and see if we can have a conversation about them and see what the conclusions uh, we can reach uh, about your work and about uh, its, uh, its ongoing relevance. So, Professor, my first question concerns, uh, I mean, the idea of it is to go over a few of your works and um, concerns dancing Jacobins, especially what you set out to do with this genealogy of Venezuelan populism that uh, also resonates with uh, how we read uh, political history in Latin America and in, in many other countries as well. And while reading your work, I interpret it to be in a dialogue, uh, I mean, in addition to your own contribution, kind of uh, problematizing certain historiographical readings that have been made about populism and caudillismo in particular, are all, and also fighting against the illusions of uh, the perfect liberal polity and this being a distortion that is pathological even about that. So uh, when reading your work, I was thinking of some of the earlier works that I read that touch upon these questions of populism, caudillismo. One of them is uh, Richard Morse in the 19, I think in 1954, towards the theory of Spanish-American government, in which he reflected upon, you know, the Thomistic and the Lockean understanding informing the, the colony and how when the Thomistic element was removed after independence time, the, the Lockean element never materialized in a sense, and, and that's why you have phenomena like uh, strongman politics, caudillos, uh, and also at the same time, and this you allude to ex explicitly in your book, John Justin in uh, uh, Born of Blood and Fire, when he says that like, liberalism was an exotic uh, plant in the soil and that this was kind of an inevitable consequence. Yet you make the emphasis that this idea of strongman politics and the centralized state came much later. Uh, so how do you respond to this historiography? How do you think your work relates to it? And what are your thinkings on, on this? Well, one of the things I want to uh, emphasize is that this, uh, what I call my work in, the, in Dancing Jacob in a genealogy of the present, this has to do with which all the, the main problems were motivated both with things that I confronted in field work and also by the political situation in Venezuela at the time in which I started. Uh, writing the book. I mean, I, I wanted to somehow deconstruct this op radical opposition between what, from official circles, was called el país de paes, talking about, you know, a kind of civil society in which, in which, you know, certain divisions of power, free press, etc., worked at the cost of exclusion of the vast majorities. And el país de Bolívar, talking about, uh, uh, as a moment in which the eruption of the popular forces is concentrated around and articulated around the figure of Simon Bolivar. That opposition was very clear. And of course, with depending on what side of the, of the political you know, barrier you are, you would demonize the other as, you know, for example, from the side of the opposition, you know, El País de Bolívar it was a completely authoritarian, uh, you know, country, it was a country that somehow dominated the mi mi majorities through practices of clientelism and so on and so forth, and violence. From the other perspective, El País de, 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 País de Paez, which was one of the two he main heroes of the of the wars of independence in Venezuela against Spain, was a, I said, yeah, it had some of the qualities uh, that it, 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 it uh, parades around uh, us having, the vision of president, but at the cost of the complete, complete denial of effective citizenship. One thing I, I try to do in the book is to show that those, both positions have a great deal of truth. I mean, I, I, I wanted to, to deconstruct uh, you know, the position, of the, op uh, the position of the opposition forces to, to uh, and, and I wanted to say, yes, there is all the dangers of authoritarianism that are pointed out in the other direction. So you have to, one of the things I try to argue in the book that you cannot, uh, you, have to, you have to somehow play uh, 
a very complicated, delicate force in which the two countries are somehow uh, kept in some kind of balance with each other. Because if you, if you don't, if you choose for either El País de Bolívar completely, I mean, articulated around a, 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 an authoritarian leader and the figure of Bolívar and uh, the mobilization of the masses, or you choose for the other, you step out of the terrain of democracy. Because it, the, democracy is a complicated uh, aporetic in the sense of a relationship without exit between freedom and democracy. And, and if you emphasize too much f uh, freedom, you go in the direction of neoliberalism and a kind of... Uh, 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 and if you do the other, you have the risk of, of falling into very authoritarian forms of government and so on and so forth. Vis-a-vis -vis the question that you asked me, I mean, I don't know if I'm taking too much time here, but vis-a-vis -vis the question you asked me of previous historiographies, generally previous historiography has written in places like Venezuela and I think in many places of Latin America from the perspective of El País de Paz, from the perspective of a, I mean there are exceptions, right? I mean, you know, there are exceptions here and there, I'm not saying that, but the vast majority of historiographic production has been written from the perspective of a saga of reaching ever more democracy and teaching. I mean, the, the, the dichotomy, civilization, and barbarism has been foundational to this historiography. So you know, the barbarous masses have to be brought up to enlightenment, and meanwhile, re, you know, the franchise is restricted, have to be restricted because the masses are not prepared for, uh, for you know, enlightened citizenship and so on and so forth. And the, the, the notion that uh, during the 19th century, uh, you know, that barbarous quality uh, it, it was an assault on democracy, on representative democracies. You know, for example, the figure of the Caudillos is if you wish a certain topos, a figure of this historiography. A figure of the Caudillos is a strong man, full of thirst for power, that has been trying to uh, you know, uh, assault central power as a booty, right? I, mean, I try to deconstruct all that, and I, I try to show that in the roots of the mom moment of independence, uh, that there is a certain uh, necessity, if you wish, for that figure as the encapsulation of a certain mass politics that emerges at the time, right? So I try to show that those things, rather than being deviations, corruptions of a certain ideal model of representative democracy, are part of the very texture, the very dynamic of Venezuelan historicity. And I think it's something that is applicable to other parts of Latin America in different forms. I mean, because one of the um, unique things about Venezuela, I suppose, I think Uruguay maybe has a little bit of that, is that it was a mass democracy from the beginning that was somehow thwarted, et cetera, et cetera. In, co in places like Chile, Colombia, et cetera, et cetera, what triumphed were the elites, the, no the notables, what is called the notables. So depending on the different, um, and, and, it's, and it's not casual that that happened in places like Argentina, Uruguay, or Venezuela, because they were frontier colonies. As, as here the notion of Lenin that the imperialist chain broke breaks through the, through the weakest link, I think is applicable, right? So these places were the weakest link of the imperial colonial Spanish chain and were places in which the institution of rules developed by the Spanish were much, weak, much more weakly implanted. So therefore it made for a kind of mass politics that in the other places was thwarted or was mediatized in much more effective ways. So that, that, that inflected local historicities in different ways. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, so from my understanding, there has been a, a tendency in part of the historiography to argue that um, what the figure of Bolivar does politically is replace the figure of the king in, uh, colonial, uh, in the, during the colonial period. So part of this historiography has argued that yeah, Bolivar acts as a, as a substitute, right? As a, as a form of symbolic regulation or yeah, political symbol of political regulation. Um, you, your, your work also goes against this, this idea of a continuity between the king as what subjects have in common and Bolivar as what Venezuelans or choose your nationality have in common. Yes. Uh -huh. And you want me to elaborate a yes, little bit? Yes, please, could you please okay, expand, expand? Okay, so this. what I, I take my inspiration there by, by, from a, a political philosopher in France, Cla Claude Lefort, and I, one of the things I try to argue, yes, there has been a tendency 
to, to, to say, in part of historiography, not all, all of it, but part of historiography to say that Bolivar is in a, a kind of a substitute for the figure of the king, precisely in so far as he is the incarnation of the totality, the majority, the nation, you have you. So the king in, in would have been the incarnation of the empire and the local provinces of the empire, and Bolivar would be nationalized. Would that principle of royalty would have been nationalized in the case of, of Bolivar. I try to say that whatever truth there might be or elements of truth there might be in that formulation, it glosses over the enormous discontinuities uh, that happen between the, the, the monarchy, uh, absolutely this monarchy as it was articulated around the Bourbon reforms and, all, and so on and so forth, and the republic. The, the, what, what is implicit in that kind of formulation is that underneath there are no differences. This is not really a revolution. This is really a matter of the continuous domination of the local elites over the population, right? What I try to show in the book is that no, that there's an enormous disruption. Enormous disruption, of course, that the local historiography has made a tremendous effort in glossing over and denying, et cetera, et cetera. And that, dis uh, and that is continuing, among other things, among many other things, has to do, one, with the eruptions of the masses in, 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 in public life, right? I mean, you know, in the wars of independence and then the, uh, from their own in the, in the struggles between federalist and socialist, <laughs> socialist, no, federalist and centralist, and so on and so forth. Uh, that eruption had to do with a thorough breakdown of the system of corporations and states that was prevalent during the colony. In that system, uh, subjects, uh, the notion of equality was absent. The notion of equality was absent insofar as the different categories of subjects were ordered by the corporations to which they belong. And there was an excess population that, you know, that went into the, into the slave, uh, you know, um, cumbes or whatever, you know, that escape uh, forms of domination in the colony, right? So there was an excess population and the rest of the population was encompassed, uh, ordered by the co local corporations, confraternities around patron saints and all that kind of thing. Those corporations have the ability to give a series of rights to subjects that were circumscribed to the corporation itself and the system was a hierarchical system with different categories of subjects uh, organized around the, uh, the, around the figure of the local elites and the monarchs. Uh, it's, a, it's a system in which the category of race was very important, especially towards the last, uh, you know, whites at the top and so on, so on and so forth. And the king is true that incarnated somehow the totality, but the notion of the totality in the modern sense, in the, mon in the modern Hegelian, if you want, sense of the, of the king as place host, uh, holder for an abstract universality was not present. So the king is true, was at the center of all the claims of the subject, but related to the subjects in singular, particularized ways, right? And what is true, talking about, uh, you mentioned Leandro when we were not in recording, mentioned Thomism. In a way, there was a kind of Thomism in the, in the sense that according to the, the Spanish monarchy, and that's something that began to change with the Bourbon reforms, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a certain legality natural legality to the world. So the, word, the king was a kind of judge of the peace that tried to organize the relationship between the different uh, uh, segments, the different corporations, the, the pardos, the elite, the muleteers, the nobility, the, and so on and so forth. That exploded, that exploded, even though the notion of corporation still continued having an, uh, uh, the syntax change. You got the mass, uh, masses in the in the in the in the, in the public uh, places of the colony, and the figure of Bolivar became a kind of incarnation for an abstract universality in the republican sense of the term. I mean, abstract universality that included supposedly all the masses out there. I mean, the figure of Bolivar told to the masses, "Yeah, you're very heterogeneous, you're very different, but underneath, you're equal. You are equal before the law. You share a kind of commonality." And so it was, the emphasis was on abstract universality mm -hmm. and not in particularity as it was the case in the Spanish monarchy. So in that respect, I think there is a quite, quite a, with all kinds of implications for ulterior history, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so therefore to assimilate 
um, the figure of Bolivar to the monarch is a kind of conservative <laughs> move which tries to say that in this history there is continuity, a kind of you know, perpetuation of the elites all the time. Paradoxically enough, that argument has been made even from a Marxist perfectly, right? But, uh, but <laughs> curiously enough, a lot of these Marxist historians right now have taken politically very conservative positions, right? Because in a way, in that seeming criticism of the elite, there is a certain enamorment of the civility that the elites, mm -hmm. with all the violence of the case, nevertheless incarnated as, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the writings of, very important writings of the Venezuelan historian Germán Carrera Damas, etc., etc., there is a Proyecto Nacional, Nacional, a national project incarnated in all those forces, right? So I try to say, yes, there are continuities, but there are also very important discontinuities, and taking them into account allows us to get at the grammar of politics and social action in places like Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, to complicate a bit this picture, because when you argue that the totality that appears post-independence is fundamentally different from, the, different from the sort of totality that prevailed in colonial times. Um, really, I, I, um, I, think the, I think that there are certain continuities that we cannot miss here. For example, um, okay, there were corporations and people were organized in corporations uh, during colonial times, but there was also a certain fluidity. Yeah. People could move Absolutely. from one class or one caste Absolutely. to the other, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And, and, um, and I wanted to press you a bit also on, on the way subjects relate to the king in, in the differences, I mean, in the way it, it differs from the way citizens relate to Bolivar. You argue that the way subjects relate to the king is um, predominantly through the singular, through the particular characteristics, right? But at the same time, already during the late colony, uh, labor, the capacity of, of subjects to produce, right, is already something that gives them the right to education, for example. Uh, Simon Rodriguez is someone who is arguing for the reform of, of school. Uh, he is arguing that Pardos and Morenos have a right to be educated. On the basis of what? On the basis that they contribute to the common good and yeah. that they are subjects of the king. So there is a sort of abstract universality here based in labor already by the uh, end of the 18th century. Um, and on the other hand, in Dan Dancing Jacobins, you say that um, these political elites uh, Chavez as the lieutenant of Bolivar, they, ha they serve as a bridge between the abstract and the singular. So would you say that in one case you have a, predominantly s uh, a re relationship predominantly based in on the singular and not the other on the abstract? And if so, on what grounds would you differentiate or would you um, build your argument? Differentiate what from what, sorry? Uh, the relationship between subject and king in the colonial times and between citizen and, and Bolivar. Because I mean, okay. for, from my point of view, I'm pressing for a sort of continuity, right? Uh -huh. I'm arguing from not from a conservative uh, viewpoint, <laughs> right? But exactly. I think that, that there I think it's an excellent question. There can be a left case for this. I think an excellent question, complicated, and it complicates my, my analysis in some interesting ways. Well, first of all, I want to say that there is a certain ideal, typical bent in the way I talk about those things. I mean, it's difficult in a book to, to look at all those things, especially when your focus is not the 18th and the, ni 18th and the 19th century, 18th century in the colony. Mm. Uh, well, that's one part of the answer. I completely agree with you. It's much more complicated. There was, uh, you know, for example, towards the end of the economy, there were a series of regulations pushed by the land landowners to control the mobility of labor, precisely because the mobility, and one of the things that they did not have is the ability to control labor. So banditry, mobility, I mean, different, like the ability of the pe peons to choose between different, uh, I mean, and, and to negotiate and bargain in terms. So there was, I, I mentioned, I do allude to those things in the book. Uh, so it is very complicated, uh, and, and it's a much more complicated picture than just, you know, a Thomist kind of monarchy on the one hand, and, a, and, and the complication comes uh, with the kind of very, very deep transformations that were taking in the 18th century, right? I mean, the, the 18th century, among other things, and I think that that is, it's true if you want, I mean, there is a very extraordinary conservative historian, Francois Xavier Guerra, who precisely uh, 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 talked about the Latin modernity uh, that began in France, if you got, with the French Revolution, all that kind of thing. And one of the emphasis of this kind of analysis is precisely that there was a kind of continuity between the kind of centralization enacted by the absolute monarchy, right, 
And, and that's an argument that was taken over by Fouré, for example, to talk about the French Revolution and so on and so forth. That has an influence in my argument, right? And the kind of developments that happened after the revolution. So, so instead of being a radical rupture, there's certain continuity that has to be, do with the place of labor in, in, uh, in these formations, with the, with the, uh, the reordering of social space by the, by the absolutist monarchies, with a, a bend towards abstraction and homogenization that was characteristic of these monarchies, and so on and so forth. So that was happening also in the, in the colonies, right? What I, I tend to, it, it's true that although I mention those things, I tend to take more the side of rupture, because I am influenced there by a group of historians that were very connected to Francis also Javier Guerra, etc., who argue precisely that yes, there were all those movements were happening in, but they were more or less a superstructural, more epiphenomenal, that there is a certain sense in which the everyday life of the colony was ordered as around an, as a notion of particularity and so on and so forth. What is happening to be sure, and I agree with you, that towards the moment of independence, all these things were in incredible tension. To, 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 say, to talk, for example, about the enactments of, of, of legislation that was pushed by the landowners in places like Venezuela, that control gave, gave, gave passports to the, to the peons, control the movement of labor, etc. You see these tensions already at work, right, which predate independence and you know, have an enormous influence on them, both, uh, both in both directions, conservative and revolutionary, right? So yes, there is a, so it's a kind of ideal typical um, formulation. I do think that it has some virtue, I still think, but I will have to uh, think more after your question, but I do think it still has some explanatory power if one is careful to realize that it is ideal typical and doesn't, you know, It is clear that uh, in your work you get to something like populism, which you examine very thoroughly in, uh, in Dancing, Jacobins, ja Dancing Jacobins, but not just. Not starting from populism, but rather from crowd sociality and crowd sociality as a challenge of government and of governing. Basically how to handle the question of crowd sociality and then you throw uh, very heavy concepts like uh, monumental governmentality and the <laughs> biopolitical <laughs> uh, governmentality. And you made a point that I think is, uh, is, uh, resonates uh, very well with what we were saying before about this monumental governmentality in terms of like basically having that presence of Bolivar uh, as basically like the, the totalizing collection of the people and of, or the idea of the nation, and also like the, that mirror of exemplarity that you had as part of the monumental governmentality that prevails in Venezuela to this day and of which Chavismo is just its latest iteration, but uh, by no means what created it. You trace the roots of this back to the Guzman Blanco regime and the amalgam of different social forces and political forces that he, hit, he had to put together in order to, to prevail at the time. So I was wondering, because you say that the biopolitical iteration of governmentality is, if, if I recall correctly, like kind of a form of simulacra that is there in its enunciation discursively, but that is the monumental governmentality that, uh, that prevails in a sense for a state like the Venezuelan and the Bolivarian state. And I was wondering, starting from crowd sociality and this idea of the management of crowds, if kind of looking at it, what may get lost in the analysis? Because, uh, and I think some of your works uh, later on kind of reflect upon this, these ideas of like the, the different forms of world making that kind of are in excess of this. Uh, what may get lost in this analysis in terms of this all sounds very, uh, in terms of the historical trajectory, very much in terms of a continuity and kind of like a, a whale-oiled engineer state ideology at the same time, but like how much of it is not historical accidents in a sense? How much of it is not intrinsic to the idea of making the nation state? Why is monumental governmental is so, so much more prevalent in Venezuela than you will see it be in other places? Well, the, the, main, the, the, the main reason I think is more prevalent, although it's, I think, all over Latin America, right? Okay. But the main reason I think is because the presence of the crowds is much more uh, strong, I mean, you know, in, in public life. I mean, uh, and one of the things I try to argue in the book that that presence is both captures, but it's always excessive with. 
respect to to any kind of monumental form of government right, that tries to encompass. It's an attempt to encompass it that always fails because it's excessive with respect to it. And that opens possibilities to the future, emancipatory possibilities, possibilities in the direction of a new form of sociality. For example, if you think of new social movements, they are more less and less articulated, or the attempt at least is to articulate them less and less around the fi leader figures and so on and so forth, right? So there is an excess there that I think is both a problem for the government, for, for government and a promise for uh, uh, other possibilities of or reorganizing the social tie and so on and so forth. But yeah, the, the main question would be that in Venezuela, uh, something that we, I think we were touching, I don't know if it, during the questions or informal conversations between the three of us, I do believe that in places like Venezuela, the crowds were never mastered in, to the same extent that they were in other places of Latin America. I'm thinking the Portales of Chile, I'm thinking the, the Colombia of Santander. And, uh, master, that's an exaggeration. There is always a tension mm -hmm. everywhere. But tamed, in a sense. Tamed, tamed, let's put it temporarily tamed more than in other places. I mean, in Venezuela, that, that force has always been there uh, much more poignantly, if you, if you want to. Uh, it's like Democracia Barda, for example, of a, of a Laurent Vallenilla Lance, which is in my book, in a way, re revisits this classic uh, Cesarismo Democratico, the Morat Democratic Cesarism, which is a classic of, of, of positive sociology in, 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 in Venezuela, right? Uh, and it gives a role to the state or the fetishization of the state that is larger than anywhere else. In other words, the state as incarnated through its emblem, believers, the heroes, etc., etc., give precisely that, that figure of the crowd, uh, of the crowd in public space, gives a, a prevalence to figures of authority and the fetishization of the state, if you want, if you wish, larger than other places. There is a classic of anthropology, for example, the magic of the state, by uh, Michael Tausig, that you know, it's a beautiful book. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's an important book. I mean, I don't, I don't think it has had the influence that it should have had. That precisely looked at spirit possession in Venezuela in cults like the Maria Leonza possession cult, which is a spirit queen, uh, you know, that uh, you know that uh, around which the crowds of the nation are organizing altars all over this. Uh, it, which you know gives an enormous importance to the icons of the of the nation state, Bolivar, the heroes of independence, and all that kind of thing. I mean, it's this figure in which the masses can see themselves reflected, the heterogeneous masses of the nation see themselves reflected and become a governable people for a period of time, right? mm -hmm. with all the tensions. That so that's part of the argument. One of the things that oh, I think that one has to go back to to understand this is the tension with, between federalism and centralism. That, that, that harks back to something about, I was saying within the tension between freedom and equality. If you want the centralist move, moment, the center, the articulated around figures such as Simon Bolivar, but ma mainly around, is the moment of equality, if you will. It's the moment in which the masses are made through reflection with the figure of the leader, uh, monumentalized, because of course the, the notion of the monument gives continuity in time to this apparatus of government, right? So therefore, statues are incredibly important to this form of government. Uh, see themselves reflected as equals, as sharing something across their differences. In the moment of independence, it's not coincidental that the Simon Bolivar, the historical figure, not the monument, I make a distinction between these two, emphasize equality, 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 that is our first necessity. Because he know that without giving equality to the masses, the thing would explode uh, in ingovernable di directions. I mean, of course, this was equality before the law. It's not the kind of so social equality that became later on uh, prominent in social discourses, in social movements, and so on and so forth. But yet, equality within the law was incredibly subversive at the time. Right? I mean, to say that a pardo had the same rights to mount horses, to be an officer in the army, to reach certain positions than anyone else, was incredibly disturbing and threatening to parts of the social elites, right? The moment of freedom is the moment of the, I mean, freedom. Freedom with all the enormous degrees of inequality and exploitation is the moment of the social, uh, society of notables, regime of notables. It's the moment in which the Bolivar principle is muted and the regime of notables tried to reconstitute the ability to govern 
in democratic representative terms, the masses, right? And the masses, it never succeeds because the masses are never successfully immobilized like in the kind of bourgeois theater that was prevalent around, right? I mean, the masses are always moving. But there is a relative immobilization of the masses during this period, and the emphasis is on freedom. And later on, towards the 90s, on neoliberalism and so on and so forth, right? I mean, so any way, any emphasis of these two directions takes you, like thinkers like Derrida or Pierre Rosan Ballon and others, I say, takes you outside of the domain of democracy, right? You emphasize too much uh, freedom in the sense of the notabiliar, in the sense of the notables, and you step outside of democracy because you have to repress the masses. You, like la, as is happening right now in Colombia, for example, with Duque. No? You emphasize too much equality at the expense of freedom, and the, dan the danger here is forms of state domination and so on and so forth. So that, that's the kind of thing that, that I think has to be juggled uh, once. I don't know if that answers your question, Leandro. I do have a follow-up, though. Okay, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Which is, if, as you say, because of excess, this monumental governmentality, is always falling short, then there comes the challenge of explaining its resilience in historical terms. I mean, from Guzmán Blanco to now, and actually like this kind of re-enhanced idea of the monumental governmentality with Chavismo and what you understand to be radical populism, mm -hmm. resorting to uh, Simón Bolívar, to the Liberator with capital L, to the pantheon of the national heroes. So if it's always been kind of, in a sense, if, uh, if the water is always pouring out of the glass uh, because of this excess, what explains the, the resilience of this very same glass in, in the art of governing in Venezuela then? Well, again, this is an ideal, typical uh, sense of uh, formulation. I mean, I think it's re uh, in fact, things are much more complicated than I try to uh, render them in the book. But one possible answer to that question is, first of all, this alternation, which what I think, I'm, I talk about that alternation between regimes of notables and, and kind of plebiscitary regimes organize a, a structure around the figure, the monumentalized figure of Bolivar, this alternation in terms of the flux and reflux of the Venezuelan masses. And the kind of, you know, like for example, uh, to go to, the, to what is going on right now, I was talking with Benjamin around that and outside of the, what is happening right now in, in a place like Colombia, where certainly a regime of notables managed to institute itself m with continuity in time more successfully than in Venezuela, what you have is an enormous repression, attempt to repress the masses, which are pressuring the street. In Venezuela, you have that alternation also. You have populist move moments where which the masses are out, are making claims, are being are being interpolated by the figure of Bolivar and the state, but are also making claims of the state, are organizing relatively autonomously in all kinds of social domains, and are excessive in that respect, and moments of reaction in which, for whatever reasons, I mean, you know, social crisis, the, the, the demobilization of the masses because of economic situation, you have a notable reactions that manage to somehow relatively mobilized the masses. In Venezuela, there's just a relative mobilization. As I mentioned in the book, the, the rapids are always moving on, uh, beneath these seemingly quiet surfaces. But uh, that immobilization, again, uh, it, it, faithfully enough, there is going to be an increase in mass mobilization, increase in social contradictions, an increase of, uh, that is going to bring Bolivar back from the background in which the notables, it never goes. I mean, it's interesting that, uh, according to the, my argument at least, it's, it's interesting that the figure of Bolivar it never goes. Even during the regimes of the notables, it's always ready there in the background to be carted to the foreground. I mean, and people talk in, ter uh, in terms of a unified people, and the notion of a unified people, centralizing notion of unified people, is an incredibly important tool of government in places like Venezuela, right? It never goes away, but you, what you have faithfully is a kind of flu, flux and reflux of the Venezuelan masses that I think is dictating, if you wish, from below the alternation of forms of government. I take, take, I take of this, I took some inspiration there. I mean, it's a functionalist uh, anthropology, so you have to wonder, you know, if it hadn't, hasn't infected my analysis in some way. But I take inspiration there from, from a book, a classic book of social anthropology, 
called Political Systems of Highland Burma by Edmund Leach. And he talks of the uh, Kachim society in Highland Bur Burma, and he says of these flocks of, 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 of two societies that he says are part of the same structure, but goes from a more hierarchical to a more egalitarian. And he talks that the Gumsa and Gun Lao are t their nations. So I talk a little bit about the Gumsa and Gun Lao are the nation of the Venezuelan history. I think that is changing. I mean, that kind of historical framework, I think, is imploding in places like Venezuela as a result of globalization, financial finance capitalism, the mobility of people, and all that kind of thing. The state is more, uh, less and less capable of framing that kind of uh, mobility, that kind of force of the, of the masses, right? But I think that that is it. And, and the issue of here of centralism and federalism is very important. Federalism somehow, I mean, for example, in the 90s was a movement of federalization in Venezuela. Everyone still waxes lyrical about it. It's true that in many cases, the moment of freedom, if you wish, wish according to the país de paz that I was mentioning before, the moment of freedom, um, the hospitals worked better, uh, you know, there were a lot of, uh, you know, local selection of, of representatives and all that kind of thing, at the cost of leaving the masses with any instance of interpolation, right? So, you know, uh, uh, very often the moment of federalism against the Jacobin moment of Bolivar is a way in which the elite regain control of the local scene at the cost of the uh, suppression of mass mobilization and all that kind of thing. It has certain good things about it, no question about it. I mean, the roads work better, there are dolls in the roads, there are, you know, hospitals work better and all that kind of thing. But the masses are left with any, and that it's a kind of pressure cooker that, pre uh, that builds tension on the a certain unifying centralizing figure um, emerges, like as the lieutenant of the dead. Simon Bolivar, right? Um, but, uh, but that's kind, kind of the situation. So centralism and federalism, that tension is also constituted uh, to Venezuelan history, to Latin American historicity, if you wish, for these reasons that I, was the main trope of social uh, struggle in the 19th century. Right? Yeah, that's um, so I'd like to, uh, we'll pick up on what, on what Leandro said, uh, particularly on, on his question of the resilience, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because I believe that, or I mean, I would like to ask you about this, uh, this resilience also depends on the fundamental ambivalence or even underdeterminateness of symbols such as quote-unquote Bolívar. Um, and in one article that you wrote in 2020 uh, on populism, Humpty Dumpty populism, uh, you pit on one hand um, what you call um, how can I say this, um, the, the, the state against uh, the social, right, or a, a form of clou crowd so sociality. You argue that a political totalization, in the case of the Bolivarian state in Venezuela, is best understood as a reductive uh, operation that hinges on the institution of a radical partition between the visible and the invisible, between the material and the spiritual, between, I quote, on one hand, Bolivar's agentive spirit as incarnated in the Bolivarian state and the figure of Chavez as Bolivar's earthly lieutenant, and on the other hand, a Venezuelan sociality devoid of any transcendence agency or spirituality of its own. This is from the point of view of the Bolivarian state. State, yes, but um, isn't there a fundamental sort of ambivalence, undeterminedness, and even illegibility on which the state's expansion also thrives? So that forms of resistance can also be forms of state expansion yeah. uh, for yeah. the Bolivarian state. How would could you please expand? expand okay, so, that? are you saying, Benjamin, that I perhaps draw too much of a dichotomical uh, between the state intervention and, and and what is happening in the social field or something? Uh, well, from my reading of of the, of the article, you pit on one hand the political theolo yeah. theological right mm -hmm. against theopolitics, yeah. Yeah. and maybe if you could elaborate on that relationship. You know, between the vertical and the horizontal, and, and that kind of thing, yeah. and the way in which the state uh, thrives or not, on the uh, expands or not, on the basis of popular autonomy. And the kind of, that's an excellent question. I mean, I, and I don't know if I have an excellent answer to it, <laughs> but uh, but you know, well, first of all, the, th the first thing I would like to to point out in terms of, of of the political theology of the state is the following: This is a revolutionary. That that doesn't mean that the state operates nowadays 
according to those political theological principles. That is a revolutionary project, as with any revolutionary project, is totalizing, right? And appeals to certain, you know, organizing spiritual principles, right? I mean, the kind of demarcation between divisible and invisible, I think, is constitutive of these projects to reorder society as a totality, right? That doesn't mean that that's the way the the, the, the state actually operates. I think that one of the things that I tried to argue in the article that you mentioned is that as the state moved, the very conditions of Venezuela in the 20th and the 21st century, globalization, uh, capitalist globalization, financialization, all that kind of thing, has weakened the ability of the state to totalize in political theological terms. Mm -hmm. And that what that means effectively is the moment of force Gains predominance, right? Uh, I suppose I, 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 I take inspiration there from the book by the by the subaltern historian. <laughs> okay, Guha. Huh? Guha. Yes, in which he has his book Dominance Without Hegemony to characterize the the, the situation of you know the imperial um, the British Empire. In, in India, right? I mean, in which yes, it dominated the social field but it did not hegemonize the social field in, in the sense of constructing a kind of consensus around a project of domination, right, in which people somehow could have some stake in the reproduction of the, of the total order of things, right? I think that that possibility, India, according, uh, Britain never achieved that possibility. I mean, and the distinction between citizens and subjects, characteristic of colonialism, is an, is an index of that inability, if you want. And the moment of force, the naked force, force not dressed in symbols, if you, if you want, or, or appearances of consensus, gain an enormous force in the colonial situation, right? Uh, I think we are in a moment like that right now. I think, we, among other things, the crisis of the nation state in places like Venezuela, but also in places, for, amazingly enough, like the United States, right? Uh, have to do, have, are, are privileging two things. First of all, the return of the colonial situation to the very center of, of, of the world, to the dom dominant metropolis, if you want. And this distinction, dominant uh, center periphery is being deconstructed to a great, great extent. And, and when, for, for example, that's something I mentioned in passing in the article that you were mentioning, uh, the, the moment of force is so clear with someone like, like Trump, for example, in which, in which you know, the is to dominate, it's a direct call to dominate the streets. I mean, I remember there was a, uh, there was a, a cartoon, and I think it's incredibly emblematic of the kind of regime that Trump was trying to institute, and still trying to institute, let's hope that, that he doesn't succeed, right? Uh, uh, you know, in which it showed Trump, the classical profile, the yellow head, the big belly, and so on and so forth, his jacket with a lash and an African-American kneeling in the floor with a collar around the neck. So I think this project is a return, this dominance without hegemony project is a return to the colonial situation precisely insofar which, you know, was present in the American, during the time of the American Civil Rights Movement in the United States, in the South, and so on and so forth, because it no longer, it, re, it, gives, uh, it gives away any intention to hegemonize the social order by privileging the moment of force and domination, right? So it's a part, I mean, if in populism is always a part for the whole, but that more or less successfully tries to pass a, passes as a whole through forms of rituals, through forms of practice. This is a whole that parades, it's a part that parades itself as a part. The true people is just the white people, and so on and so forth. So I think in different, in complicated ways that thing is, is present in a place like Venezuela so far. For example, I did field work in Venezuela among the Caminantes, and what you have is the Chavista people living through the border by, 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 by droves. Right? Of course, that you know, has to do with sanctions, economic sanctions, but it also has to do with fundamental problems inherent to the Chavista project to somehow construct a viable hegemonic situation. So what you are getting more and more is that kind of dominance without hegemony, but I'm not sure, I'm sure I'm going away. Can you, can you reiterate a, a little bit your question? Because I think I am skirting the question. If, if you could clarify as to the necessary osmosis that there is between uh, the state's political project of totalization. 
based in a sort of political theological you know sovereignty and the theopolitics of the social crowds that you that you analyze what I, what I it's not osmosis what I think and perhaps I, it's possible that I'm drawing too much of a of a dichotomous distinction there I mean and I, I see your point what I'm saying is that the theopol I mean uh, when when the state posits itself as the incarnation of the whole of the spirit of Bolivar or in the case of Trump which is a right-wing revolutionary project of sorts, as the founding fathers of the nation and so on and so forth. This totalizing principle, in a way any spirituality that is recognized to society is from the start in that kind of formulation subsumed by the totalizing uh, principle of the... When you get a kind of spirituality, and that, is, that takes root as my book on field work I did uh, in the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s in the Maria Leonza possession cult in Venezuela, right? It was interesting, and, and, and in a way, the, you know, one never invents, reinvents itself as much as one would like to, right? But this kind of distinction between state principles of totalization and principles of, of few, of excess, of um, horizontal dissemination, and so on and so forth, was present in my experience of the cult from the beginning. When I first did field work in the Maria Leon, this is a cult to explain very briefly of a spirit queen sort of surrounded. There are three figures to, to the right is a soldier, black soldiers from the wars of independence to the left is an indigenous cacique of the wars against Spain in the 16th century. There are, the three, they are called the three potencies, the three potencias, and it's called, like it's a, a, a populist cult because it tries to encompass the totality of the figure in these three races. It's a very racialized way of constructing the totality. And, the, and Maria Leonza, the queen at the, at the center, is white. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maria Leonza, the prince, uh, the, the prince at the center, is white. It became whitened over time, which is only telling you how much this racialized ordering of social relationships is important in Venezuela, because it was originally an indigenous princess, and so on and so forth. Yet, yet in the main emblem of the course, she's almost like a snow white princess, right? Uh, it was flanked by a black soldier and a, 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 an indigenous soldier. What in populist ideology in Venezuela are the three main races. The, the, the spirit possession cult by which the mediums of the cult are possessed by spirits from the war of independence, by globalized spirits, even Richard Nixon I think appeared one day in Vikings, barbarians, you name it. It's a very mediatized cult, very influenced by television, I, I say. Uh, what is crucial about this is that the spirit takes possession of, and, the, and the medium gives messages. If it's Bolivar, messages about the sad state of the nation. If it's a medical doctor from the beginning of the 20th century, will perform an operation in you. All kinds of things like that. The important thing about this is this enormous diversity and enormous, uh, as enacted through processes of mediumship, uh, it's an incredible excess. At the time in which I did field work, I was very afraid to go there. I was doing field work in the figure of a dictator, Juan Vicente Gomez, as a fetish for the state and so on and so forth. I was afraid to go because I know a book of someone who I respect a great deal, it's a friend of mine, was coming out of there. So I say, okay, I'll go, I do some hit and miss, uh, you know, visits to the mountains where the cult is enacted, a beautiful landscape, tropical landscape where people are performing the rituals of possession, I'll go there and I'll just see what has to do with Gomez. To my enormous surprise, I realized that the whole analysis of Michael Tausig was very limited because was emphasizing a bit like what I do in this, in this paper, the figure of the state, Bolivar, etc., etc., and talked about all the other spirits which were the vast majority, Vikings, barbarians, you know, Richard Nixon, you name it, globalized spirit, as riffraff, as an excess that really an excess visa is the state. What I realized when I went that that excess was the name of the game. Mm -hmm. That to be sure whether it was, uh, if in fact it was true that the spirits of the war of independence, Bolivar and so forth, acted in the course as incarnations of the state, that state was being overridden all the time by the serial possession of myri myriads of spirits. So that, that kind of analysis with that kind of analysis, I went back to the moment of the independence in, in, and that tension between heterogeneity and centralization. 
and, and, and in this paper, right? Now, it is possible, it's something that I have to think hard about it, because it's possible, as, as you perhaps suggest, that there is a certain, that excess, that moment of excess is counterposed to starkly to the moment of totalization and the state, and it's true that the state itself thrives on those fo forms of excess also, right? Um, I have to think more about it. I tend to think that there is a ten the, the moment of tension is more determinant than the mo moment of capture, but it's a good question. It's open. Thank you. So um, building up on, on Ben's questions in a sense in this uh, dichotomy that is not such, I think that uh, upon reading Seized by the Spirit and your experiences with uh, La Hermana Juana parading the the squads of the and, the, and the, the occupation of the Sharagui building, excuse my Rio de la Plata pronunciation. There's all, all, all uh, not false, but pseudonyms. I forget that I had. I uh, yes, I imagine. <laughs> and then, and there you see, because you know, the other bet noir when talking about uh, Latin American politics alongside populism is Pentecostalism. Yeah. And I think that here, with your emphasis on crowd sociality, you in a sense, you can have better grasp of the seamlessness between the two, which is why... Between which two, sorry? Between like the, the populist moment and also a Pentecostal moment, especially once the structures of representation, as you said, have been eroded after the 1980s, uh, structural adjustment, and yeah, how the, like, the basic like, uh, hierarchies that go with representation in a, in a more liberal sense have been eroded. And in a sense, Something like La Hermana Juana and these Pentecostal squares like seizing buildings because they are actualizing the, the will of the Holy Ghost upon which they, they are only vessels uh, s resonated, and as you said as well, with like the, the theological, political uh, Bolivarian state, which goes against, uh, again what, uh, with what Ben was saying. Like in a sense, you see more of a seamless political moment in which this excess reinforces and is at the same time reinforced exactly. by this uh, Bolivarian state uh, and its, uh, its theological political iterations that explain and are explained by these political theological iterations and these forms of excess. Because as, as much as you say that sure like what these squatters is, are doing is illegal in terms of they are seizing buildings and that they pose a challenge, uh, it, it kind of resonates with the same political imaginary at the same time of like being vessels to like a, a higher force, Bolivar uh, whether or the it be Chavez, Ghost. Bolivar or the Holy Ghost, uh, and like they belong into a, a collective polity. So Excellent. does this erode or, the, or does this reinforce? Because uh, it's I a similar both. temporality in a sense, I think right? both. I mean, I, I think figures like Chavez or the Holy Ghost or Bolivar are figures of excess from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think for, uh, my one of my inspirations to think about this is the frontispiece of the book Leviathan uh, by Thomas Hobbes, right? In which what you have is the body of the king and the kingdom inside the body as a series of little knots, as a series of discrete individuals, which of course, if you think, if you deconstruct the image, you see that those discrete individuals are already forced into individuality by a series of practices of powers. Each of them can, can be think of plural singularities, right, that are somehow encompassed. So you cannot figure, uh, think of the figure of the absolute monarch, or the figure of Bolivar, or the figure of, of Chavez, or the, or, or the Holy Ghost as it performs in Pentecostal cult, outside of that excess on which it feeds, right, because you know, it, it necessarily it couldn't be it, it comes out as a response to it, but also feeds, thrives on it, right? But it's also being com constantly uh, e exceeded by it, right? I mean, one of my, my my figures usually, you know, a lot of crowd sociology, sociology, especially nineteenth-century crowd sociology, emphasize the notion of the leader, right? Like if you think of Gustavo de Bon, even in Tarde, in a more complex, Gabriel Tarde, in a more complicated way, there is always the mass exists teleologically geared towards the leader, which is, now what I argue and others have argued is that the leader performs in this literature as a hinge of government. Because the a, a crowd is not true that only exists for a leader. The leader, the crowd always has a, a, a horizontal existence of metamorphosis, mutation, like in the Maria Leonza cult, that is always going on. 
So the moment of the leader is a moment of ca uh, capture, but a, th there's very interesting. I don't know if it's in the in, in, in La Foule, the, the crowd, the book by Gustave Le Mans, there's a footnote. He said, you know, it, it, I, I've heard, he says, Gustave Le Mans, that the other day a leader was seen in the street chasing the crowds moving away from him, right? So that moment of excess is already recognized in the literature. So you have to read uh, 19th century crowd science sociologist, someone like Walter Benjamin would have said against the grain. Because if you see it against the, that tension between capture and essence is constantly at work in, the, in this literature, right? So the same thing is true with this figure, the figure of the Holy Ghost as possessing Hermana Juana, Hermana, Hermana Juana, yes, that's not her name, but that's what I used in the, there was too more, much illegality in the paper to use the real names, right? Uh, 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 it, it, as something that possesses and tells her to, 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 to seize territory, to seize real state and all that kind of thing is a moment of encompassment of an incredible plurality of the, of the crowds, right? But it's also being accessed and in that respect it's very, and it's something I didn't mention in the Seize, I should have mentioned but didn't mention in the Seize by the Spirit paper, which is a paper on Pentecostalism, is that the fundamental order of the, of the, of the Pentecostals is the Maria Leonza cult. So that moment of the Pentecostal of dissemination, of course, is very is, is very clear why it should be so. It's a moment of idolatry, which is you know multiple go gods, uh, you know multiple deities. Uh, I call it theopolitics in that other paper. It's a moment of dissemination, right? And that moment of dissemination is precisely that moment of encompassment through the figure of the Holy Ghost takes place. But I also say, and that that, that goes back to the issue of excess that the, under the present conditions, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that moment of encompassment never stabilizes. And figures like the Holy Ghost become a kind of rogue operator trying to, trying to encompass territory, trying to encompass a situation that is incredibly mobile, invasions of, of, of real estate in the city are happening all the time, Things are going on all the time. So there is that tension between excess and encompassment that I think is there, that is epitomized, I think, in the case of the, the Pentecostals by positing as its other a spirit possession cult that is all about dissemination. It's not canonized and so on and so forth. Of course, you know, you can see the tensions between centralization and dissemination also in the Maria Leonza cult, but I think the moment of dissemination is very clear there, right? with this proliferation of spirits. And I mean, a single session, a medium of the Maria Leonza cult can easily be possessed by 20 or 30 spirits in succession coming and going all the time, right? Um, so yes, yeah, a follow up to this. Uh, I was thinking that you frame this uh, Trinitarian Pentecostalism and the promise of the prosperity gospel that is embedded in this attitude of uh, Hermana Juana, even though obviously they come from a situation of hardship. And you say that this is in the end related to some sort of like a neoliberal aspiration or a neoliberal fantasy. What, has, what God has created is there for us to take. And given that this is taking place simultaneously with a moment of historicity that places populism in, uh, in, the, in the theological political of the state, do you see that, uh, in a sense, this populist aspiration, whether revolutionary or not, is not also embedded by neoliberal fantasies or permeated I by neoliberal so. I think so. I think there is a clear connection between neoliberalism. I mean, it's not coincidental, for example, that in under Chavismo, the moment of extractivism, mm -hmm. which is a very strong neoliberal moment, is so strong, right? I mean, I don't think that it can escape that logic. That's the problem. I mean, there is an attempt to control it, dominate it, encompass it, mm -hmm. but I don't think it can escape it. And I, so I think there is a certain fusion of logics here, both totalization, but a certain kind of uh, emphasis on the neoliberal, you know, uh, pri privatization, production of, uh, so th that is going on at the time, I think. Okay. So I guess to finalize and as a way for us to bring various elements that have been discussed together, like even though you depart from crowd sociality as basically how you, your standpoint to, to look into this political phenomena and, and not just, 
populism is always there embedded. Where you're talking in Seized by the Spirit about Pentecostal squatters, in, in Dancing Jacobins, in the modes of managing and governing over excess that arises from these crowd socialities. Uh, and uh, even in Maria Leon's, I mean, there's a crowd and there's the grievances that are expressed or not. So populism, in a sense, and you know very well the many ways in which it is used as an analytical category, but at the same time, you know, we're going back to Guzman Blanco, as you say, as the kind of like what made Venezuela a populist state through monumental to Bolivar, even. and to Bolivar even. So, but it seems like it's we're in a fuzz of usage of the term populism, many times to censor, many times to like posit something as another that is pathologized, and also as a way to kind of going back to what we were saying before, like this Sarmientista interpretation of the civilization y barbarie. Yeah. So, to what extent is the term populism necessary for us to understand if we don't want to perpetuate this political imaginary? Or what is it telling us that like makes us needed? Uh, I'm thinking of Benjamin Arditi and its idea of the unexact, that like, it's there, we cannot grasp it, but it's still something that we need to talk about. That's like, a good uh, what, what does it add and what risk may be pursuing? Why is it necessary to refer to it as such and not to these myriad forms of agency and ways to relate to the political? But, uh, uh, one of the answers possible is if you focus on the myriad forms of agency, you are bypassing the moment of politics and totalization, right? Mm -hmm. So but, but populism becomes a means to get at that moment, perhaps not the best one, uh, that's a different thing. But the other uh, part of the answer is that whether I am successful or not in my work, and I understand that possible criticisms can emerge there, I try to, uh, I am critical of Ernesto Laclau's formulation, but I'm also very influenced by them, right? And, and one of the places in which I am influenced is by the notion that uh, populism is not a pathology but it's a moment of the political, a moment of totalization, you want. I mean, better than in his book on populism, in the new reflections of a, for a revolution of our time, he talks of the people and populism as the moment in which a totality shattered by antagonism is made whole again. I think he probably found that formulation problematic because he doesn't repeat it quite like that in, in his book on, on populism. But I think it continues being effective in that book, right? So, so the moment of populism first m needs, uh, talks about the state and that moment of totalization. Now, it's problematic to use populism for the 19th century because it, there is another term that was used in the time, right? And I should probably have said it explicitly in my book, I didn't. Regimes like Napoleon III in, in France or, or or, um, or, you know, Guzman in Latin America, but Bolivar never, no one talked about a populist, but I do, but not, not. Talked as bonapartism, bonapartism, right? But if you analyze what is meant by bonapartism, it's not all that different from populism. The, the reason I decided for the term populism is because it inserts, it's a very presentist, if you want, move. It inserts the discussion in a series of contemporary uh, uh, questioning for and against, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, you know, as, as you say, it can be criticized for being too anachronistic or too presentist, if you if you wish. I mean, but and the other reason is because it brings the moment of state totalization, its pro possibilities and problematic nature, the excess to, with which it constantly has to wrestle to the fore. I mean, so it makes it an object of discussion, right? Uh, so that's the other reason. And the, and the, and the third thing is that this, this, this tension between crowd politics, I mean, is always consubstantial to the discussion of populism. Populism is always talked more or less explicitly in reference to a crowd, right? In reference to a crowd. Now, the, the, the problem is how do you theorize that crowd? I mean, in some places, like in La Clau, the crowd is contained in a series of discrete demands, et cetera, et cetera, the moment of simultaneity is encompassed by the state and so on and so forth. I try to take a notion of the crowd that problematizes the moment of totalization while, while giving it its necessary uh, attention or something like that. Um, thank you so much for being, uh, for having been with us uh, today. Um, it was a great discussion and, um, and it gave us a lot to think about. So I think these questions are going to be haunting me for, for the months or years to come.
and I look forward to to keep them in my head going. Yeah. Thank so you so much. Thank you so much, Rafael. So it was very productive also. Uh, thank you so much. It was a great discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's it, huh? <laughs> 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 <laughs>